Great to have you all back for our 219th show of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And we're back broadcasting live from two, uh, excuse me, three actually, wow, wow, uh, different parts of the world, which is from Long Beach, California, with our leisure legacy legend, Ron Lindgren, and our conscious of our islands of Hawaii, DeSoto Brown, back in Honolulu. Hey guys, good to have you back. So um, we can we get the first slide up? We want to be a little bit uh, sort of sentimental, maybe melancholic, romantic in some ways. And um, so we want to talk about zeitgeist of the 80s, actually. And that's something that, you know, for you guys, depending on how old you are or how young you are, it means different things. And we often uh, experience that, uh, you know, talking about the other arts is helping us uh, to um, understand architecture more and where society stands towards the discipline and the profession. So this one here is talking about music and uh, is using Holland Oates, who would have been performing in the Blaisdale in a couple of days, but the concert was pulled. I think that's the third time it was pulled because of somehow COVID related uh, and, and all the management and the organization. So we'll have to miss out on them uh, once again. But um, we want to talk about Hall and Oates. And uh, Ron, I shocked you before the show that I was comparing you to uh, Daryl and uh, and John uh, as your as your buddies, which you said you would have never thought uh, that would uh, you know you never thought of that. And the point is that we talk uh, you know different arts have different uh, kind of uh, you know places in in, in culture. We, we're taking a break from automobiles and architecture. And automobiles, as we said, they, they are made to be on the spot so people buy them at the moment they are out uh, on the market. And then when they get old, uh, often uh, people start to dislike them. And as you said to Soto, sometimes if then some people keep them and, and restore them, they become vintage and collectibles. And so it is with their appreciation and also so it is with their value, right? They cost Absolutely, a lot when you yes. buy them, then they basically, the price goes down. And then if you're lucky at some point, they basically go up again. And um, you also you can basically then, I mean, the cars are basically then getting weeded out and they end up on the junkyard and you have less and less of them. Uh, with music, it's it's even more. Music can just turn off and don't play music anymore on the radio, and then the the music is gone. So Holland Oates are musicians who uh, basically are you know they started in the '70s, but their prime time was in the '80s, pretty much. And um, they um, are for me an example of what we can call. I mean, if we we talk about zeitgeist, there's actually something to be above and beyond that zeitgeist, which we then call timeless. And I've been a uh, proof of evidence that Hall and Olds are of that kind is that some, not that many years ago, probably a decade, which is a lot, but it must have been because I was still in the prairie at that time. And there was the Nebraska State Fair and there were all cowboys and horses and pigs and Hall and Olds playing for <laughs> them and a couple of people. And uh, a few years later, actually, uh, that was the last time when, before COVID, they were filling the Blaisdell uh, two nights in a row consecutively. And we know the Blaisdell fits many people there. So they went from like a small crowd to the big arena. And, but they played the same. They were just as passionate in front of the pigs and the cowboys and the horses as they were to this massive audience in the main arena in Honolulu. So I, I, my feeling was they're like true artists who always did what they believed one should do. And it just, they hit the spot in the eighties. That was their prime time, but their music is still around. And if you hear it, I actually had some, you know, guys on the beach recently, some uh, urban nomads, how we call them, the homeless had Hall and Oates on. And it reminded me of that. It doesn't, you know, sound dated. It's still like, still has the same pep. And if you don't think about when, when it was first played, you, you know, you don't even, and that's what we call timeless, right? 
So uh, we want to talk about um, your project, Ron, that um, is the most timeless and the most zeitgeist resilient or resistant in all of Honolulu and Waikiki. And that is your Halikolani that was built. And that's why I make this comparison in the same time in, in the beginning and mid 70s. So uh, let's go to the second 80s, slide. 80s. Oh, 80s, of course. 80s, of course. Yeah, that one. Because all in old started in the 70s. And there's obviously killings with projects from starting in the 60s as a Kahala and then the 70s as we did many shores about it. So this slide here is basically uh, the, the, the right column is nothing else but uh, you having to see us because we want, why would you have to care how we looked, how goofy we looked? back then, but we want you to immerse yourself in your memory and thinking about how did I look and more importantly, how did I feel? What was the vibe of the times of the mid eighties? That's what we want you to do. And you Ron then provided us a picture of uh, the Lures Lounge ground floor, how it looked like back then when you had uh, just been uh, basically creating it and tell us a little bit more about it, especially also in reference to the two show quotes above that picture. Yeah, we, you were making a, a connection between myself and Hall and Oates. I've never met the gentleman, but I've certainly heard them often. Uh, and the word timeless is, is, is a connection in the sense that uh, as the lead designer for the Holly Klani Hotel, uh, we, I and all of the uh, uh, willing accomplices, the great other design talents that work with me, all had the idea that uh, th that architecture could take on some timeless aspects, just as I'm sure Hall and Oates felt that their own music uh, was timeless in their own minds, and so they would play it to all and whoever would, would listen to it. But we're also going to be talking about uh, trends in hotels where, as they, as they do require, every several decades, sometimes sooner, a hotel needs uh, a refreshing. And that can be anything from uh, the physical aspects, the fact that uh, technology has changed. Uh, there's all sorts of new, new things to be incorporated into the hotel that weren't available as technology when it was first built. Uh, but there's a tendency also to, in renovating, to maybe forget the timelessness and try to wedge in something that is sort of of the day, of the time. And when you can easily identify something as being from a certain time, it might just be because that was a fad at that time. And Certainly my intention, the intention of, of the Killingsworth office and all of the designers with us was to look at something a bit more uh, timeless. In the upper left-hand corner is a picture of the Lures House lobby as it looked in the 1930s. Now to be fair to those who renovate, there are changes of taste. There are some times when materials aren't available any, any longer. Uh, there are some overriding considerations that mean that when you renovate, the appearance does change somewhat, uh, and perhaps even in a major sort of way. When I uh, saw what the 1930s lobby looked like, the fact that it was very Hawaiian, it seemed also to me just maybe a little bit too kitschy. If you look closely, there are things like tiki torch lights on either side of the fireplace. There are some sort of uh, over overly bright, I'm sure, uh, tropical fabrics on the open chairs. There was a, a clutter of a lot of small photographs and artwork, uh, which was uh, symptomatic of the time. When you look at the bottom uh, left picture, you see what my interior designer and myself thought of, that the room should be traditional. There should be the flavor of the 1930s, but without some of, some of the more kitschy items. And so you can see that the furniture is still uh, rather stately, it's overstuffed. It's a room that your maiden aunt could feel very comfortable in. And uh, as it turns out, that sort of Chinese Chippendale table that shows in the very center of the picture with the flower arrangement on it, actually came from the 1930s Holly Kalani lobby 
where my interior designer found it and uh, refurbished it and used it as a centerpiece for that space. Yeah, and that one, uh, and picture number two is a show quote from when you were introducing the Halekalani to begin with uh, about almost like two years ago, as we can read there on the picture number two. And that's a picture I took uh, of when I was introduced to the Halekalani by our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, when she was pulling me into the Halekalani and said, I think this is an interesting place. Let's discover that. And we were like, you know, venturing through the hotel and ending up there. And after that becoming our favorite place that we made this uh, almost a ritual or a routine and always having sitting down there, catching a breath, enjoying just the atmosphere. And that table you were talking about was obviously still there. And now we get to the point, why do we do this show here? Another show, because we already did a show. Well, the, the point is this, your hotel has been just recently remodeled, right? So now um, we're very curious about how that turned out. So for that, let's get us to the next slide. But with another sort of found object of memories, because this is a strange hybrid of, uh, of Finnish, um, um, you know, micro architecture by Alva Otto and things in there that you collected that have a lot to do with the memory about the place you designed, Ron. So what is that? One of the things that I happily was able to do after the hotel first opened was that I still had many, many occasions to be sent to the Holly Clotty to assist management with further steps in the development of the hotel. For example, when it first opened, there wasn't a full port cocher. Uh, to drive under. There was rather something, a rather stubby cantilever that was a little bit awkward, but we got to design, we had the opportunity to go back and design a full, and what I think turned out to be a, a very elegant urban experience under a port cochere. Each time that I stayed at the hotel, I would stay at the hotel at their expense, thank God. And at that time, every night, uh, just before I would go to sleep, when the bed was made up, a small uh, little white box with a beautiful white ribbon appeared on the pillow. But instead of being that chocolate, which I think is kind of a mistake. I mean, you've already brushed your teeth. You want, it, you want your nice rest. Uh, to chew into some, some chocolate at that time might, might not be such a great choice. What management did at that time was to provide every night a different and very beautiful version of an ocean uh, uh, shell, a seashell. And so uh, in my recent renovation of the home, after some water damage incurred, I decided to display all of those shells, which represented every day that I stayed happily at the hotel, still working for them uh, and carrying out the obligation to see that the hotel uh, would be carried to what it was meant to be, including its port cocher and some other items that we worked on and added in the first several years of the hotel being open. Okay, and let's walk to that Port Cochere, uh, go to the next slide because we see it there in the distance. And this is documenting, you know, the slide, uh, the show quote at the bottom right is basically, again, from two years ago, that was the first time we uh, read on the title page of the Star Advertiser that they wanted to renovate your Hali Kalani. But then it took them pretty much uh, two more years or one more year actually to start. And they basically used again as many, uh, the kind of the pause of COVID that they had anyways and said, we might as well, you know, take advantage of that and, and, and get something done during that time. And so they were reopening on uh, October 1st. So this is again, uh, Zuzana here, and I at night trying to figure and find out what is going on, but we couldn't see much because it was all fenced off. So uh, we, we were very, very curious not to say anxious. And so the next slide um, is from the ocean side where um, again, they couldn't or didn't want to fence it off as much as they did it to the front. And we were a little worried because that uh, sort of edge of the pool was, um, wasn't looking like it used to with these very nice mosaic tiles. And, um, and so, um, but it turned out to be a technical renovation. 
I think that edge needed to be redone and it actually was redone in the original sense. So that was a relief, especially when we get to the next slide, uh, because of the press that the, uh, the hotel was communicating on, on this sort of, uh, you know, hospitality blog. And how, how did this feel for you, Ron, when you as the originator, the, the father of, of your baby here, when you were reading this? You know, obviously, we, we were always concerned about what might be happening at the Holly Klein during the time that it was closed during the pandemic. It certainly was an opportune time uh, and a timely time to renovate and freshen the hotel. But would that freshening in any respect minimize maybe what some of our primary concerns were and my primary concern as, as the lead des architectural designer? My concern right from the start came from the name of the hotel. The Holly Klani means the house befitting heaven. And so my, the, the, the whole thought, the whole design precept was that there should be a timeless tropical home for discriminating travelers who learn to love Hawaii as their destination. This was the prime uh, design precept would there be some things happening, especially in the interiors, that might uh, compromise some of the residential character that we thought was so important and so historically apropos this time? Well, let's see. Yeah, and what made us worry is at the first paragraph here, it says, and they're quoting the, uh, the chief operating officer, uh, Peter Shandlin, and he said, in order to preserve Halikolani's legacy as the hotel heads into its second century, the restoration has been both, both meticulous and wide ranging, <laughs> encompassing the hotel's physical infrastructure, which is fine, as you said. And in fact, you had to, to do this to your boss's initiating project, the Kahala after all the systems and the plumbing and the wiring were outdated. So that needs to be done. Also, the guest rooms and su suites, that's something we might not like and we don't. We will talk about this here, but it seems to be this global pandemic of, as you said, that they think after, and Susanna actually says it's almost like seven years or something, they seem to swap out and try to make it contemporary and that way erasing and eliminating uh, feeling it's originating zeitgeist and this timeless zeitgeist. But here in the middle, they also set the public spaces. And that made us very, very, very worried. So let's take uh, you on our continued voyage. Next slide. Yeah, I'd like this to was, say that in my mind, yeah. anything in, in a renovation or a restoration or whatever the term might be, anything that compromised its residential scale would be yeah. a mistake in my mind. And that's just yeah. a fact. Yeah, and you were stumbling over a term, wooden panels, that you didn't find that encouraging, right? That was in the last paragraph of that one. So uh, when it got closer to the reopening, um, they must have had the need to open this one talking panel, wood panel of the construction fence here <laughs> to move things in and out. And we were immediately jumping and taking a peek through it. And that gets us to the next slide. And, you know, you designed it very jungly, uh, so made it a little hard for it to peek behind because we couldn't walk in there yet. They would have chased us out, kicked us out. But what we could see uh, was very promising because we, something that you, because we will introduce your home renovation that you had to go through, not that you wanted to, but you had to for some tragic circumstances, as you already indicated including your, your landscaping. And so that one even needs to be done periodically. You need to, you know, plants die and you need to plant new ones and you constantly have to work on plants, there's no doubt. And they seem to have done this here primarily, at least we were hoping. And so um, the next slide is uh, the first, I think the first one I sent you, Ron, to, uh, to keep your hope up, uh, because that was the, the first night uh, of reopening. And again, um, from here, everything looks pretty familiar, not to say the way we remember it from you having shown it to us in the three shows we did about it some two years ago. 
And I must say, the 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 slide just before that and this really put a, a smile on my face because uh, what uh, hotel management was saying, and I'll quote it right from their hospitality net description, was when they were talking about gatehouse and port cochere and so forth. Quote. They want to revitalize to further enhance its welcoming aesthetic and spirit of aloha. Those are the right words. But better than that is it looks like what they said in those two slides. And so I was really pleased with what uh, people who have come back to the hotel after this long period of pandemic closure will now discover as their hotel experience at the house befitting heaven. Yeah, and coming back, of course, I did immediately the morning, the next morning that gets us to the next slide. And I saw this situation that, again, looks very familiar to us because it's exactly and unchanged. But we see something here. We see some suspension cables for these palm trees. So they basically enhanced it uh, landscape-wise and added what you, I believe, appreciate a lot because that's a lot of your... Of your of your design, as you shared with us in in these shows, how you basically put uh, palm trees in there as been part of the scenery. So they've been adding to that one here, which you know seems a good thing, right? Yeah, that was that was the opportunity all throughout the hotel property, but by adding some more palms in front, it, it uh, uh, even strengthens that idea. Uh, we went up into the hills above Honolulu and talked to neighbors and bought their palm trees out from under them. And they were willing to sell 70 and 80 foot palm trees. And so we weren't, you know, planting a, a, something that should only come out of the tub for a few years, but we were putting uh, trees that were decades old and giving sort of an instant imprinture imma of age and of, uh, of timelessness. And it's wonderful to see these palms and the wonderful uh, a shadow play of moving palms on what otherwise is a boring stretch of asphalt. Yeah. And, and how you so cleverly made that transition from that boring and actually heat island effect that's uh, increasingly, you know, asphalt to the sort of tranquil, uh, meditative, um, welcoming spaces of the hotel gets us to the next slide. Um, and that one, there's you up there at the top right, uh, these two years ago when you uh, gave me the tour, and it looks just like that, right? So unchanged. Yeah, more, more smiles on this face. The, uh, the water, it, it, the, the photograph doesn't make it all that clear that what's actually happening is that that's a very large, very shallow waterfall. And a very straight edge of water is peeling over the top. And then when it falls to a, a water basin below, the water trickles on some protruding edges of tiny pieces of marble that we chipped and broke and, and built up uh, to create a, a wall of water. Now, this creates a coolness when you first walk into the hotel as a pedestrian. It also creates a beautiful masking noise. I swear, and those who go to the hotel will, can, can experience it themselves, when they're up on that space looking back down Lures Road, you do not hear the traffic, you hear the, the, the gentle susurration of the waterfall. But I also, yes. purpose, I also purposely did not raise the waterfall so high that you couldn't see down the street. I wanted to see a contrast uh, as to what uh, urban jungle you were coming out of and what quiet retreat I was creating when you turned around 180 degrees. Yeah, yeah, and it is incredibly successful. And I have always admired that well before I ever knew you, knew who, who had done it. The fact that this does keep out the noise of the street, which is a busy street. You've got a busy intersection right there. It keeps out that noise. It also disguises the fact, but does not cover up. It's not a forbidding huge wall that walls you in. You have a view to look at, which is not an unpleasant urban view. It's actually a rather nice looking urban view, but the combination walls you off enough 
that you're not right in the middle of it and you are within the tranquility of the Holly Kulani. And I think, again, well before I knew who did it, I always admired this. So let me say to the guy who did it, thank you. You did a wonderful job. <laughs> thank you. And, and so did Suzanne, obviously, and then lured me back into. So now here we all are. So let's keep on walking through and we probably make it through one more slide. Next slide. We turn 180 degrees and then we turn 90 degrees to the right. And there's more water in which we see at the very edge of the image there. There's a very, uh, there's a, a, an axial symmetric because you pointed out many times that Ed and you guys are classicists in a modern way. And so the, uh, the, the lobby is, um, you know, axial symmetric and there are these shallow uh, pools on both sides. But this is this wonderful trellis area there that um, being very inclusive, the hotel is, it also allows people to smoke a cigarette, but they're only allowed it to do it here. If that's the best use of space is another question. But again, um, you know, has anything changed here? No, nothing has changed. Although I remember that you said, Ron, you would have wished it to uh, go more back to how it originally was. And you hold one of these flowers and you said they were going all the way down to the floor, right? And many of them, not to say almost all of them. Seasonally, there were times when this white Thunbergia vine was something like a curtain that you had to walk through. The flowers hung from the trellis all the way to the paving. You basically had to take your hands and, and open the curtain and walk to it. I give uh, hotel management a lot of credit here. Uh, you know, it's a Japanese uh, owner for the hotel. Many, many Japanese uh, clientele coming there. And the Japanese have a tendency to smoke. Uh, because of the, the uh, rules about smoking, uh, throughout the United States and Hawaii. Here they provided a place where the Japanese in the most elegant ways possible could walk down this beautiful axis through the Thun Virgia vines, sit on an, an Edward Luke Jean's garden bench, a classic in itself, meet each other as smokers and maybe create friendships for life, uh, all in this architectural context. And I give uh, Halakani's management a lot of credit for creating this uh, almost necessary feature for a Japanese hotel. Yeah, and even the wood. I mean, the wood is the most vulnerable to having to be redone and whatever, but here, you know, even the wood slats are basically kept there. So yeah, kudos to them. That gets us to, believe it or not, the end of our uh, 28 minutes already. So um, we can't wait to walk further through and, uh, you know, be um, increasingly excited. Obviously now here, you know, this is, has been comforting because our hopes are high. So let's hope that continues to be the case. So for that, we see each other again next week. And until then, uh, please stay all very um, timelessly tropical. Bye-bye.